for tapes of end-time meetings, deliverance services, or Lake Hamilton Bible Campgrounds publication, Voices from His Excellent Glory, Declaring the Kingdom, writes Post Office Box 21516, Hot Springs National Park, Arkansas, zip 71903. Our website is www.lhbconline.com. There are many free audio files there. It's like going to Bible school at home. Memorial Weekend Deliverance Seminar, Friday evening, May the 23rd, 1980, Lake Hamilton Bible Camp, Hot Springs, Arkansas. Wynn Worley is the teacher of the evening. This is tape one of two tapes of this service. Uh, if the morning meeting gets over by 2.30, we'll start another one. If it doesn't get over, we'll just continue from 2.30 on. You can come and go as, at your discretion, but today it did last till 2.30 or 3.30, <laughs> just kept lasting. Praise God. Well, Glenn said this is not a church, so we're not very churchy. We're all churched out, really. <laughs> we just have meetings all the time, Holy Ghost meetings. That's the best. Go to your church. This is not your church. This is Holy Ghost meetings. We don't know how the Lord's going to move. Now, Brother Worley, he's going to sing for us and teach us some new uh, worship music and his wife's going to play and uh, and we're going to put him on at eight o'clock are you in shock or anything about it? you have a lot to say tonight he does he does yes <laughs> well come on are you going to move this thank you for coming and we'll see you all tomorrow uh i don't know who's going to speak in the morning you glenn well, you know, isn't, isn't this my pet name for Do Well, I have him a pet name, and I have all of them a pet name. My pet name for Dr. Haggard is the horse doctor. He's a veterinarian, but boy, he's a good one. He promises to bring shots for our dogs every time, but never shows up with the shots. <laughs> The demons are also very much aware of Dr. Haggard. They very often say, Haggard, go back and doctor dogs. Leave us alone. <laughs> so, praise the Lord. It's good to be back in Arkansas. And I bring you good news from all across the country. Uh, from Ohio, from New York City, from, uh, from east to west, to north to south, down on the Gulf Coast of Texas. Deliverance is moving. It's exploding like a... There's nothing the demons can do to stop it. They're crying out in desperate terror all over the land because uh, it's tearing up the turf. I had a call from a principality in New York City. I'll tell you about it in a little bit. Just this Tuesday, and he harangued me on the phone for 45 minutes. He was very upset. And he said, we want you out of the ministry completely, Worley. We want you stopped. We want you out. What do you want? I said, I've got what I want. <laughs> and uh, he said, well, you can have everything you want here or you can just have hell on earth, whichever you prefer. I said, well, just let out all the stuff, big boy, because we're going to mix it up. And I bring you good news. God's army is rising Amen. all across the country. It's the most amazing thing I've ever seen in my life. It's coming. Uh, just this last Sunday in our services, Sunday morning, we were just singing a nice worship song I'm going to sing for you that came from Missouri and uh, it's spreading across the land too and uh, it was given by the Holy Spirit to a man in Missouri and we picked it up brought it back and been singing it across the land in, in the meetings and while we were singing this a demon exploded and then another one and then another one and then another one and we just kept singing for about 15 minutes while the workers cleaned house <laughs> And we just went on with the song service. It's a song called I Believe in the Lord. It goes like this. Very simple. You'll pick it up in a little bit. I believe in the Lord. I believe in His Word. I believe His love was sent from high above. is the one who 
hate it all. Without him there's no hope for me at all. The Father sent his Son, the victory is won. Jesus is the one who paid it all. I believe in the Lord. I believe in his word. I believe his love was sent from high above. I believe in the Lord. The Holy Spirit came to take his place. To help his children win the daily race. Greater things than these shall you do in my name. The Holy Spirit came to take his place. I believe in the Lord. I believe in his word. I believe his love set from high above, I believe in the Lord. Now try the verse. Jesus is the one who paid it all. Without him there's no hope for me at all. The Father sent the Son, the victory is won. Jesus is the one who paid it all. So I believe in the Lord. I believe in His Word. I believe His love was sent from high above. I believe in the Lord. The Holy Spirit came to take His place, to help His children win the daily race. Greater things than these shall you do in my name. The Holy Spirit came to take His place. I believe in the Lord. I believe in His Word. From high above, I believe in the Lord. And then there's another song that we continue to sing, and it's catching fire across the land, the new Bill Gaither song, The Rain Song. Play it, honey. <clears throat> you know it, sing it along with me. The turtle dove is singing the sweet song of morning. The leaves on the trees turn the silver cups up to the sky. The silent clouds up above are beginning to gather. This barren land is thirsty and so am I. It's beginning to rain. Hear the voice of our Father. He's saying, who's the Drink of the water. I promise to pour my spirit out on your sons and your daughters. If you're thirsty and dry, look up to the sky. It's beginning to rain. A young man's eyes start to shine as he tells of his vision. And the old understand what he sees, for they dream their own dream. With the thrill of being alive, they reach for each other. And they dance in the rain for the joy of the things that they've seen. It's beginning to rain, hear the voice of our Father. He's saying, whosoever will come drink of the water, I promise to pour my spirit out on your sons and your daughters. If thirsty and dry, look up to the sky, it's beginning to rain. 
At the first drop of rain that you feel, you'll open the window. Then call all the children together, throw wide the door. When the rains of the Spirit are falling, fill every vessel. For he who drinks his fill will thirst no more. Sing it out. It's beginning to rain, hear the voice of our Father. He's saying, whosoever will come drink of the water, I promise to pour my Spirit out on your sons and your daughters. If you're thirsty and dry, look up to the sky, it's beginning to rain. I want you to stand up and sing that chorus one more time. Stand up and stretch. You're kind of tired. Stretch your arms up like this. It'll rest you. Now, while we're doing that, it's beginning to rain. Hear the voice of our Father. He's saying, whosoever will come drink of the water. I promise to pour my spirit out on your sons and your daughters. It's a thirsty and dry look up to the sky, it's beginning to rain. All the people said, Amen. You may be seated. Praise the Lord. As I said, I bring you good news. The enemy is in full retreat everywhere. He is being attacked and attacked and reattacked. And he is really getting panicky, believe me. Deliverance works are springing up everywhere in homes and in a few churches that are opening the doors. And uh, it's just amazing what's happening. Procter & Gamble is in full retreat. They hired, they hired Newsweek to write them a cover-up article and they released to the Associated Press a hush-hush on their witchcraft symbol that's on every product of Procter & Gamble. And you need to get that stuff out of your house and call Procter & Gamble. Let me give you the number. <laughs> Toll free. At... No, no, we've got a new one. <laughs> they disconnected one 800 number and we got another one. 800-582-0345. Let me repeat it. 800 800-582-0345. Now, if you can't get through on that number, don't hesitate to call. Here's a collect number you can call. 513-562-1100. 513-562-1100. They'll accept collect calls on that number. We're not supposed to know that, but that'll teach them to disconnect their 800 number. <clears throat> All right. Now, if you don't know what we're talking about, the Procter & Gamble trademark is a man in the moon, just like the one on the Tarot card number 18, it has 13 stars and it's in a circle. It's a witchcraft coven symbol. This was shown to one of our ladies in the thing. We had heard nothing from anybody else, but some other Christians across the land have also been alerted. God is calling people to revolt against this stuff. You see, if you bring in a cursed thing into your house, an abominable thing in your house, the curse that's on that will come into your house also. And Procter & Gamble uh, put out everything from Duncan Hines cake mixes all the way to uh, Charmin, Crest Toothpaste, Head and Shoulders, you name it. we got a complete list, by the way. They also, for the past two years, they have won the dubious uh, honor of sponsoring more pornographic and filthy TV programs than anybody else on the whole horizon. So it's time they got hit and hit in the pocketbook. Since we've begun a one-man crusade across the country and getting people to call in and protest and tell Procter & Gamble they're quitting Procter & Gamble or they changed their logo, uh, Procter & Gamble has put on a massive sales campaign. They've, released sale, they've, they've written up one letter, and that didn't do it. Now they've got a... Uh, by the way, when you call in, tell them you're calling in to protest their trademark, and they'll, sell, they'll, tell, they'll take your name and address and send you their explanation. If you can swallow their explanation, you can believe anything. Because that thing just happened. They'll say it ha it's been that way 150 years. That's a lie. The first thing they put out told the truth. That symbol has not been that way for a, uh, to a relatively recent times. It, uh, but if you can, do, you can uh, accept their story, well, write in and get it. It'll cost them a lot of money to mail it out. <laughs> yeah, she called me too. They tracked the line to his lair. 
And uh, she called me about it and wanted to know what I was upset about. And I told her, of course, she didn't understand it. And uh, I said, and if you don't do something about it, I'm going to have to continue to warn the people across the nation. And I said, you know, I travel quite a bit. She said, oh, yes. We're getting calls from all over the United States and Canada. They know exactly where I've been traveling because everywhere it's exploding and people are calling in and and uh, what you do, you go in and you cut all the trademarks off the Procter & Gamble products you have, use them up, and then quit Procter & Gamble and switch. And when they get hit hard enough in the pocketbook, they'll do something about it. As a matter of fact, she told me, she said, well, if enough people get upset, we may have to do something about it. Praise God. All right. We've got some uh, dirt on Pepsi-Cola, too, but we'll give you that later, maybe. All right. It's time that... It's time that we rose up and boycotted some of these things that are deliberately flaunting God. And that's what it is when you bring a witchcraft symbol into your house. The devil is on the move. We need to boycott all these fantasy movies like Star Wars and The uh, Empire Strikes Again, which has just been released and has been a smashing success. I understand this week it just was re-released in Chicago and has bigger crowds than the Star Wars did. Friend, that's, that's fantasy, and if you feed on that, you're opening yourself to demons. Just like the Chronicles of Narnia and all the rest of the garbage that uh, has been put out by uh, J.R.R. Tolkien, that stuff is pure witchcraft. And if you open up to it, you're not biased. You say, well, I can look at it and it doesn't bother me. Don't be too sure. The very fact that you're so drawn to go and see it or go and dig into it may indicate there's something in you wants to be fed if you want to feed that tiger cub and grow him into full-size Bengal tiger, you can do it. He may be a little fellow now, but he sure will be hard to handle when you feed him. You better not feed him. Starve him. And then throw him out in Jesus' name. Now, before I get into the message proper, I would like to take just a few minutes and tell you something very significant, I think, that happened. I think the last time I was here, I mentioned to you that of course, uh, many of you were aware that uh, the Illuminati had set a date in October to freeze all checking and savings accounts and throw the nation into a financial tailspin, which would be followed by the issuance of new money. They uh, first said they would issue 20, uh, one of their bills, new bills, different colored money for 20 of yours. And uh, then another latest report we got to about 50 to 1. And uh, so they're planning to get you one way or the other. Now, this was planned for October. We heard about it. Other people heard about it. We called across the nation and alerted people who knew how to pray, how to bind and loose spirits, and we attacked in the heavenlies. Our church poised for a massive attack. We hit them in the heavenlies, and a lot of other Christians who knew how joined us, and they were stopped cold. They couldn't do a thing. They were frozen. In November, they set another date. We found out about it. God sent somebody from Washington, D.C. to our church, and they stood up and told us about it said, it's coming again. So again, we attacked. Again, they were stalled. The first part of this year, I was up in Canada, northwest Canada, in Vancouver. And I was dealing with a demon who was a world ruler. He looked at me and he was cursing me and calling me a lot of nasty names. And he said, Whirly, we hate your guts. He said, we're going to wipe you out. He said, you quit going across the country telling people that an avalanche of deliverance is coming. He said, you quit that said, you terrible man, said, don't you know that that would ruin everything? And he looked at me and said, you do know, don't you? And I said, mm-hmm. <laughs> he said, well, you fool, he said, before we would allow that to happen, we will collapse the banks and throw this whole economic system into disaster and throw the country into World War III before we will allow deliverance to come. Now, that's what the spirit world thinks about deliverance. Did you know that they're not really concerned about a lot of other piddly poop religious stuff that's going on? They could care less about these million, multi-million dollar cathedrals piercing the sky. That doesn't bother them in the slightest. But you get out on the floor and throw out demons, it scares the daylight out of them. You're rocking the boat. You're dynamiting the foundations. A lot of people are shooting pea shooters at the roof. Brother, when you get under it with a crowbar of deliverance, you're wrecking the whole superstructure. A lot of preachers don't know that. A lot of churches and a lot of Christians are unaware of it. But I'm telling you the truth. I've been across the country and the universal cry has stopped that deliverance. Stop those books. Stop those tapes. Well, this demon roared on at me and he, he was talking about we're going to destroy everything. 
I said, I thought you were going to do that last year. He looked kind of strange. He said, yeah. He said, we had everything set up a couple of times. Something happened. I said, I think I know what it was. He said, yeah, you and that blankety blank church. You're always in fear. You and those other dumb Christians. <laughs> he said, but Worley said, you can't just hold out forever. You can't just brace it up forever. I said, don't count on it. We're recruiting new help every week. Week by week, we're raising up new army, new people to shoot into the heavenlies. <laughs> well, they do get disturbed. What I'm telling you people is that this business of binding and loosing spirits, you listen closely to what Dr. Haggard has to say. Not about me, because he sometimes tells things that are not right. But when he gets on binding and loosing spirits, Listen closely, for God has given this man a peculiar and wonderful revelation concerning this area of warfare. What I'm simply trying to get you to see, people, is that this battle is crucial. This is the one. This is it. If deliverance does not come, there is absolutely no hope for this nation. We are that far gone. We're not almost there. We're hanging over the cliff right now. And if deliverance doesn't come, there is no way that the thing can be stopped. Even slow down. Now, last Tuesday, I was in the office of the church. The phone rang. And it was a little Latino boy, 17 years old, Joe Garcia. He called me from New York City. And he began to talk. He said, I'm tormented since I was nine years old. I've been in the occult and Satan worship. I am tormented. I'm going crazy. I don't know what to do. I'm a Christian. I know what I ought to do, but I cannot do it. And he went on and on with the, terror, the usual horrible problems. He said, I'm all burnt out on all that drugs and all the mess that I was in. I want to be free more than anything else. I said, well, son, how did you hear about me? He said, that's a strange thing. He said, I was on the subway the other day, and a man walked up to me that I'd never seen before. He handed me a slip of paper with your name and phone number on it. and said, this is a man of God who can help you, son. Call him. And turned and walked away. Said, I never saw him before nor since. That's an angel, people. God's angels are busy. Whether people like it or not, whether they know it or not, they are moving. They sometimes look like people. The devil has some like that too. Be careful. But anyway, this boy, I taught, we talked on and I said, well... I told him about a church that was near him where he could get some help. And I gave him, he took down the name, the address, the phone number, and everything. And I said, now I'll be there next month. I'll be there, in, uh, I'll be there next month, and uh, I'll see you then. But you go there and get some help now. So he said, okay. And I said, well, let me see if I can bind those things up that are tormenting you so before we hang up. And I started binding the things, and they started exploding and coming out. They started screaming and coughing and everything else on the other line for a long time. And then when they finally settled down, we got them all bound down quiet. He thanked me. He said, oh, wow, something's happening to me. I said, yep, you're right. <laughs> and um, so we bound them all up, and then I hung up. About five minutes later, the phone rang. A voice with a heavy Spanish accent on the other end said, Pastor Wynn Worley. I said, yes. You're a dead man. I said, oh. He said, why do you keep doing this to us? Why do you keep bothering us? Why are you harassing us all the time? I said, well, who are you? I had a sneaking notion. It turned out it was a principality in this boy. Now, a principality is pretty high. Under him, in this same boy, he had 747 chief princes, 7,000 princes, 2,000 legions. Now, you figure that out. A legion is over 6,000. Now, that's in one boy. That's why I know that some people who have been in the occult have not been delivered yet. No wonder they're leaving their wives. You're welcome. Listen, you don't get people free that quick. It doesn't unwind that easily. The devil does not give up with a wave of the hand and a high old, hearty high old silver and away into the sky. Friends, you've got to get out of the business and plow those things out. This principality went on to rave and scream at me. He walked. First he said, what do you want? What do you want? We'll give it to you. 
I said, I have just what I want. You know, nothing like a good fight. Well, he went on and on, and he was, he, he'd break, and break into cursing, and he'd race off into tongues, and I would pray in tongues. He said, stop that! I said, well, you started it. Now, this went on for about 45 minutes on the phone. He said, I'll tell you what, Worley, I'll prove to you that I'm telling the truth. I'll tell you what we're going to do. I said, no. He said, in five weeks, this was last Tuesday, there will be war with Iran. I said, is that so? He said, you'll find out I'm telling the truth. I said, we'll see. He said, there'll be bombers up and down the East Coast, bombing the, nation, bombing the East Coast of the country. I said, bombers from where? He said, from Cuba, stupid. I said, no. I said, well, thank you very much. Now we know what to bind and loose. <laughs> See, we'd just run into the spirit of war a couple of nights before in southern Illinois, and uh, he was raging about what all he was going to do, too. <laughs> the spirits of war don't care for our church either. We've been binding them regularly. I'm telling you people, we have authority over these things. We need not put up with it, and we're fools if we let it go. Amen. And if we're stupid enough to let the devil get us off track and piddling around with a bunch of other piddly-poo things, we better get on the job and start binding and loosing. And this world ruler over in Vancouver was screaming at me. He said, he said, we hate you. We've got to get rid of those stupid books and those dumb tapes. And above all, we've got to get rid of you and that ignorant church of yours. And all the stupid fools across the country that believe like you do. I said, well, there's not very many. Just a few people, a few thousand books. He looked at me and said, Willie, you know it doesn't take very many. <laughs> I said, you're absolutely right. You're right on. Back to this principality. He told me that by 19... He said, watch 1981, Willie. That's it. By 1981, he said, we'll have everything sewed up. He said the Illuminati will be front page news. Everybody will know about it because by then it will be too late to do anything about it. We'll have complete control. And he said bloody persecution will come against you. Christians said we'll get you then. He said the young people will go into the wildest rebellion yet. Drugs and every rebellion and bloodshed, everything is going to fly apart by 1981. said so that's it. That's the target date. I said thank you very much. We shall proceed to attack on that level and bind those spirits. You see, you can change the course of things. God wants it changed. If we, if we sit on our religious hands and do nothing, we deserve what's coming. I'm urging people to come out of the trenches, fix bayonets, and charge! Attack! He went on to tell me. He said, we've already got Derek. He said, we killed his wife. I said, no. Oh. I said, I understand he's coming back. He said, well, he's not. I said, don't count on it. We're praying for him. And other people are praying for Derek Prince to come back into the deliverance mainstream. We need his voice. And every bit of news is encouraging. I was dealing with a demon in another place. And the demon screamed at me and said, don't you get Frank Hammonds in this place, Worley. I said, oh, I don't know. We probably will one of these days. No. We hate him. And he said, and Prince. Oh, I said, Prince. I said, we all hate him. I said, I don't know. I like Derek. I said, I, I imagine he'll be here one of these days in Hegwish. He said, no. I said, what are you so afraid of him for? He's not doing deliverance. He's off in another field over there. No, he's not. said, two nights ago, he was six hours in deliverance, were they? I said, thank you very much. That's what we've been praying for. You can't take that bird dog out of Prince. He's got it. He'll come back. You know something else we're doing, people? We are praying for Jimmy Swigert. We are praying for Jim Baker. We are praying for David Wilkerson. We are praying for Ralph Wilkerson. We are asking the Holy Spirit. We are loosing revelation. We are loosing wisdom. We are loosing counsel. We are loosing understanding on those men because they are men of God and they have a blind spot where deliverance is and they are deadly foes of deliverance. But they won't be when the Holy Spirit shows them it's true. They will swing all their weight in behind it. And we need to pray for those brothers. Amen? Wouldn't you want them to pray for you if you had a blind spot? Yeah. Everybody can't be perfect like that. <laughs> no, but seriously, pray for these men of God. Pray for Pat Robertson. He does know. And he's moving ahead. Pray for those 
And those seven cassettes, video cassettes, that were shot at Hegwish in December, they're too hot to handle. They're sitting on the shelf. They won't release them on the 700 Club. <laughs> but we've got an edited version of them, and I suspect they'll go over to Pittsburgh Station later on this year. So praise the Lord. Just keep praying. And pray for Pat Robertson and his protection, because he's attacking. Bill Gothard is attacking. He's attacking the Illuminati. He's attacking the world system. He's telling people to throw garbage out of their house, get rid of the occult, and watch out for demons because they're attacking on every front. This is the latest Gothard seminar. He's coming down the line. So praise the Lord. Pray for Pat Robertson. He's busy binding and loosing spirits. I spent ten minutes talking with him, and he was very interested about loosing spirits. He'd never heard of that. But he's been doing it on this program. Ever since then, he's moving into the battle. More and more. He's already always been in the battle. Now he's moving with new authority. We need to pray for these people. Amen. The demons told me, he said, we got Derek. We got Basham. I said, what would you do to him? He said, well, he tore his car all to pieces. I said, really? I said, uh, how'd you do that? He said, well, it wasn't hard. He said, we got a bunch of drunk idiot kids. And they smashed in and tore it all to pieces. He said, oh, he'll get it fixed. He said, it's a lot of harassment. It takes a lot of time. I said, we're praying for Basham, too. He said, Pastor Broke. Pastor Broke's son said, we got them, too. I said, oh. I said, we're busy praying for them, too. He said, you're always messing around and bothering things. Leave things alone. Leave us alone. I said, no way. Well, we moved. He kept on talking about me dying all the time. Every once in a while, he'd fly into a rage. And, oh, we're going to kill you. We're going to kill you. We're going to kill you. And I said, and he said, you leave Joe Garcia away alone? said, he is supposed to be a deliverance minister, and you stay away from him. I said, you I said, you better work hard, demon, because when I come to New York in July, I'm going to lay hands on that boy and load him with every gift God's given me. I'm going to pour it on him. He screamed at me over the phone, don't you dare, we'll kill you. I said, you better work hard between now and then. I'm a coming. He said, we'll kill you. We'll have him put a knife in your back. I said, oh. I said, you keep talking about killing me, demon. I said, you know, I've had several prophecies that told me that I would in no wise come home until my work was finished. I said, had you ever thought about the fact that if you happen to slip past these angels and actually kill me, that the Lord would raise me from the dead? That would be embarrassing, wouldn't it? <laughs> there was a long silence on the phone. The demon said nothing. And then he started spluttering and cursing again and screaming in tongues and, and the curses of Lucifer upon you. And I said, go right back on you. I don't want them. <laughs> and he went on and on and on. What I'm simply trying to tell you people is this. I don't want you to focus on me. I'm just one of the workers. But the ministry is the thing that the enemy is terrified of. This principality told me, said, you stop. Said, you are, de you are destroying the kingdom. <laughs> you know, uh, the reason I stopped and laughed every once in a while is because the first place is kind of funny. And the second place I was in deliverance and... I stopped and laughed like that, and the demon said, Shut up! Don't laugh! said, Those laughs are on those stupid tapes! said, This idiot has been listening to them all day long! He said, We hate that laugh! We just, Ooh! He said, It's just, it just horrible! <laughs> so I made a note to laugh more. What I'm simply saying is this. The tapes that are going out from our place and from many places across the country, and from Lake Hamilton and other places, Carrying the message of deliverance are blasting the foundations from under the devil's tent. He's running scared, people. He's running scared. I pinned the demon to the wall and I, I said, Can you really kill me? Can you? Come on. I don't want to talk about it, he said. I said, Can you kill me? Come on. Speak up. Maybe you can frighten me. He said, Oh, no. He said, That's the one thing we haven't been able to do. He said, If we could ever find out how to scare you, Worley, we'd have you. And I said, how about killing me? He said, you know we can't. You'd be dead a long time ago. But I said, we'll keep trying. <laughs> now, to give the devil credit, he does not give up easy. I want you to focus on the ministry because it's Jesus' ministry. It isn't Win Worley's ministry. It isn't anybody else's ministry. We're all just involved. I'm just one of the servants. But I'm telling you people, this is the ministry of the hour. It's going to gradually take over everything. There's coming a day when evangelism will come through deliverance. 
Healing will come through deliverance, and deliverance will come through deliverance, and nothing else will stand. Everything else is going to be wiped out. All of these little lovely ministries are going to flutter out like a bunch of butterflies. They're going to be gone. Deliverance is the only one that's going to stand. If you want to get something that's lasting, you better get in the deliverance channel because she's the only one that's going to make it all the way to the end. You say, I guess you think you're puffed up. No, I'm just glad to be in the middle of the stream. Come on in. The water's fine. Not restricted. You know, some of these ministries are restricted. You can't be there because you're not talented. You're not called. Let me tell you of a ministry that's not crowded at all. Has tremendously simple entrance requirements. Those who believe in my name shall they cast out devils. You say, that sounds good. You suppose we could find any? Yeah, there's a few still running around. There's no danger of you running out of business. Praise the Lord. But I want to share those things with you to let you know that God is moving. He's keeping His Word. The devil is a liar. The rumors about his invincibility and the unbeatableness of the demons are greatly exaggerated. He can be had. Come out of those theological pillboxes of theological safety. Come out of those trenches. There's a big old tank lumbering over there. And it's tur- it stopped and it's wheeling the gun around. Now, most of everywhere I go, I find the troops going down like this. Oh, dear, you suppose we can hold out faithful to the end? You know what I tell them? Fixed bayonets, troops. We're going to charge that thing. Blow the treads off of it so it can't get away, and then we're going to take a can opener and open it up and see what's in there. We have the authority. We have the strength from Jesus Christ if we'll take it. And I hope you'll get mad as the, uh, mad as all get out at the devil. If I can make you mad at the devil, you quit getting mad at each other, and you'll start fighting the real enemy. You know, one of the big problems that we face, this dreadful, dreadful thing, can a Christian have a demon? But a Christian, a born-again Christian, cannot have a demon. That's what you hear. It's not what the Bible says. It's not what experience proves. But that's what's being taught on every hand. Turn in 1 Corinthians 5, please. You may want to get a pencil because we're going to go rather rapidly through some scriptures. Can a Christian have a demon? Can a spirit-filled Christian have a demon? You bet. Matter of fact, they're prime targets. The devil's got the rest. Let me just mention one thing to you right quickly as an introduction before we even get into the Scripture part. When you got the thing about, the problem about demons being in Christians arises mainly from a misunderstanding about salvation. When you ask Jesus to come in your heart, you're born again. You got saved. Tell me something. What? You are body, soul, and spirit. Tell me which part of you is saved. The spirit. Because you're still having trouble with your mind. You're still having trouble with your body, right? Okay? Your soul is made up of your mind, will, and emotions. You're still having trouble with those, aren't you? Hmm? Body, soul, spirit. In the body, you're having trouble. In the soul, that's mind, will, and emotion. You're still having problems, right? Okay. If you're honest, and of course you tried to flim-flam us, you might tell us you're not. But most Christians are honest enough to say, well, in my mind, will, and emotions, I'm still having problems. Now, the Spirit is the one part that's sealed. The Holy Spirit, according to the Scriptures in Colossians and other places, becomes the earnest of the inheritance. He sealed our spirit against the day of redemption. The spirit is very likely located right here at the base of your skull, right at the top of that spinal column, right in that area. It's a central, where the central nervous system comes out of the brain. It's a good control center. And there are indications that that's where it is. But at any rate, that's the part of you, your spirit, that's sealed with the Holy Spirit, who is the earnest of that. It has sealed under the day of redemption. That's what the Scripture says. We've even checked this from the enemy. The enemy has confessed repeatedly, even though they would say the person's not saved, nor born, not born again, when we forced them to the wall and made them admit, I said, look over to the Spirit and see what you tell me and tell me what you see. They said, there's a 
seal there. I said, reach out and touch it. He said, no! You know we can't touch it. If they can't touch it, friend, they can't undo it. But I'll tell you something else we've learned. They can try to smother it. And they'll layer around the Spirit to keep you moving from moving freely in the Spirit. Now, your Spirit was sealed. The place where the demons are operating is in your soul. Mind, will, emotions, and that affects the body. All right? Now do you see how you can be saved and still have an area that's out of control at times? Not all the time, but part of the time. Some of these people who say you can't have a demon, you know, what they're saying is we just got wiped clean. Let me tell you something. If your skin was brown, black, or white when you got saved, it stayed that color when you got saved. Didn't it? There was no change. And a lot of other things stayed the same. And if there were demons there, people, they did not automatically come out. They took a back set. I love to, I mean, deliverance when I get a hold of a demon. I say, you remember the day he got saved? Yes! Yeah, it was a horrible day. I said, oh, really? He said, oh, he thought it was great. Fool. We told him, don't do that. He did it anyhow. Then I say, you remember the day he got baptized in the Holy Spirit? Yes! That was just as bad. They know, people. They're in there. Whether people like it, whether they acknowledge it, doesn't make a whole lot of difference. The devil's not in the business of publicizing his business, but God is. God's ripping the covers off so we can get at these things. And you're not going to gain anything by denying what's obviously true. Now, of course, people, well-meaning people, come up with all these arguments. And the arguments they use, most of them I heard from the mouths of demons a long time ago when we were in deliverance, telling you you can't do this because of this and that and the other. They're arguments used by the enemy. Look at 1 Corinthians 5, 4 and 5. He's talking about a case of extreme sinfulness in the Corinthian church. He said, In the name of our Lord Jesus Christ, when you are gathered together, and my spirit with the power of our Lord Jesus Christ, to deliver such an one unto Satan for the destruction of what? That the Spirit might be saved in the day of Jesus, the Lord Jesus. Sounds like somebody had something wrong in their soul and body, doesn't it? But it sounds like Paul was interested in the flesh being destroyed, if necessary, that the Spirit might be saved. Let's look again in 1 Timothy chapter 1. 1 Timothy chapter 1 and verse 19. Of course, when you go into uh, Thessalonians and Timothy and Titus, you know that's Grandpa, his son, which is Timothy a little shorter, and Titus is a little bitty fellow. That's how you know which way they go. In 1 Timothy 1.19, holding faith and a good conscience, which some, having put away concerning faith, have made shipwreck, of whom is Hymenaeus and Alexander, whom I have delivered unto Satan, that they might learn not to blaspheme. These are men causing dissension and problems in the church. And they had gotten to such a place, Paul delivered them up to Satan. Look at Second Timothy 2. That will work, by the way. Just be careful. Be sure the Lord's telling you to do it. Second Timothy 2, verse 25. In meekness, instructing those that oppose themselves, if God peradventure will give them repentance to the acknowledging of the truth, and that they may recover themselves out of the snare of the devil, who are taken captive by him at his will. Are you getting a picture of some people who have played the fool and gotten hung up? Hung by the heels? And these are people inside the churches. Let's look a little further. Well, first of all, Let's, uh, there, there's basically somebody's reduced this five major arguments to prove beyond the shadow of a doubt that a Christian can by no means have a demon. Let's look at those for a minute because you'll bump into these and variations of them. For instance, they say, uh, the Christian is inhabited by the Holy Spirit and the Holy Spirit cannot coexist with the devil or with demons. Why? My body is the temple of the Holy Spirit. The Holy Spirit lives inside. And there is no way that the demons and the Holy Spirit could live side by side. That's what the Scripture says. It doesn't say any such thing. 
It certainly does not. Let me ask you something. You've got an old sin nature. If you don't believe it, read Romans. That old sin nature is just as filthy, rebellious, and rotten as any demon that ever lived. That's why they get along so well together. And in that old sin nature, the Holy Spirit lives right alongside. Where is the Holy Spirit? Sealed up in the Spirit. That's why when you pray with a prayer language, you pray out of your spirit. That, is, that part has been saved, cleansed, and is inviolate. First John talks about the new man sinneth not. He's sealed up in the Spirit. And that's why you can pray. The Holy Spirit gives you utterance to pray pure prayer, unaffected by the body or the soul. And that doesn't mean you shut down and don't pray in the other. You're supposed to pray in the understanding. Pray with the Spirit also. You need both kinds. Now, that's one of the arguments. And then uh, you'll hear this. First John 3.30 said, Jesus was manifested to destroy the works of the devil. And when Jesus comes in your heart, He destroys the works of the devil. He sure does. But He does it in accordance with His Word. And He said, These signs shall follow them that believe. In My name shall they cast out devils. And that comes right after evangelism. First, go into all the world, preach the gospel to every creature. Second, throw out demons. Now, Another pious argument that comes, well, the struggle for the believer in Romans 6 and 7 is presented as a struggle between the flesh and the spirit, not as a struggle with the devil. You heard that one? That's, that sure sounds religious, doesn't it? It is a struggle with the flesh and the spirit. But remember, the flesh is the place where the demons rest and gain their strength. This is why many of the demons carry the names and are exaggerated characteristics of the sin of the flesh. Because they roost in the flesh, and they exaggerate and strengthen the pushings of the flesh. The old flesh nature, the sin nature. Now, you'll hear this argument. Believers are delivered from the power of Satan. As Colossians 1.12 and Ephesians 2.1-3. And indeed we are. We are delivered from the power of Satan, but not automatically. My spirit was delivered instantaneously. Bang! I was born again. It wasn't a process. I didn't grow into it. But it wasn't long after I got saved I found out I still had problems. It wasn't with salvation. That was fixed. It was with the flesh. The old body and soul were giving me problems. Now, this, uh, this deliverance from the power of Satan becomes a battlefield. Pictured in the Old Testament, by little and by little. Now, if we think it's automatic, then why isn't every Christian perfect? Now, you think that through. These people who say, well, Jesus was manifested to destroy the works of the devil. Well, that's indeed He was. However, this deliverance is not automatic in this life. It becomes a matter of moving against the enemy and uh, taking the weapons of our warfare and attacking the enemy. I'm telling you people, the most things that are fought, most of the things fought about in the churches have nothing to do with spiritual things at all. I mean, in some churches, the biggest argument is who's going to sing the solo on Sunday? Or what color is the ruffle going to be on the new nursery curtain? I mean, that's really a powerful thing. I mean, you know, the nursery committee has, they're locked in battle about this thing. I mean, that's crucial. If you don't believe it, you see how many hurt feelings and wounded spirits there are. Of course, they'd do away with the Sunday school. They'd make a giant step forward. It's not scriptural. Even Bill Gothard's come out against it now. Last seminar, he attacked the Sunday school. He said, it's not scriptural. I said, praise the Lord. That's what I've been saying a long time. In Old or New Testament, there's no basis for Sunday school. Children are to be taught in the home. Mom and Daddy are supposed to come to church to the assembly of the believers and the Word of God be preached, followed by signs and wonders to get them so charged up. They go home and they have something to teach the children. Obviously, not much is happening. About the only sign you see around most churches is the one that tells you what the name is. The wonder is anybody comes back the second time because there's not really much going on. That's sad. It ought not to be true. I've never seen so many do-nothing Christians. You know, you, you hear people talking about the end times. We better 
uh, stock up food and things like that? Well, you better. You say, oh, the ravens are going to feed me. Oh, wonderful. I didn't know you had an Elijah ticket. I've got news for you. There are more Joseph tickets than there are Elijah tickets. If you've got a Joseph ticket, it won't cash on an Elijah Raven train. And frankly, friend, I've been out across the field. I haven't found many people tangling with Jezebel, and that's what Elijah was doing. That's why he didn't have to stock up. Elijah wasn't warned ahead of time. Joseph was warned for seven years. We've had more than seven years warning people. You're welcome. Now, they, uh, a lot of times, you know, people, that, another argument that comes, the Christian has protection. In Ephesians 6, the great armor, the shield, the helmet, the breastplate, the loins girt around, and the shoes, and all of this. That's right. But this armor, if you notice, is all against enemies coming from the outside. Isn't it? Why? Because there's another way to deal with the enemy within. That's to cast him out in Jesus' name. Then you only have to face the enemy from without. Now, of course, I know what it is. It's, it's sort of like the story somebody told. I think it's very apropos. They tell about a lake way out in the mountains somewhere where people went fishing. And this particular fisherman, he went out with his boat and he caught fish a lot. And uh, he used to hear uh, people talking about catching fish that were three foot long. And he'd never seen a fish over a foot and a half long. So he knew they were lying. One day he was out in his boat. He put down his line. And guess what? He pulled up one a full yard long. He looked at it, took it off the hook, and said, just another line. He put back. <laughs> Did you know that that's what some people are doing about deliverance? They say, there are no demons in Christians. I hear people talking about it, but they're just making all that up. Couldn't be. Couldn't be. So guess what? One pops, bluey, right under their nose. Ah! Starts screaming, throw it on the floor. You say, now do you believe? <laughs> Just another lie. They won't believe even the evidence of their eyes. It's incredible. Absolutely incredible. Chuck Smith, Maranatha Ministries out Calvary Chapel in California. You've got to see the track he put up, attacking deliverance. Incredible, that man. One section of it, he was attacking deliverance. Christians can't have a demon under no circumstances. And yet, 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 but the usual, you know. And, uh, but one paragraph was so interesting. He said, you ask me, what do you do then if you say that they can't have demons? What about these Christians who cough, who gag, who vomit, who writhe on the floor, who scream, who curse, who fight, all of these things? What do you do with all these? He said, I don't call such unscriptural manifestations, so I don't have to explain them. <laughs> I could not believe. That's in black and white printed. It's just another lie. They won't face it. They don't want to face it, people. But I'm sorry. We are in the time when they're going to have to. If you run across somebody who's just dead set against deliverance, you know, what to, you know how to fix it? It's kind of nasty, but I'll tell you how to do it. Once in a while, we have somebody take the cudgel against us in the past, not recently. But uh, one man, one preacher attacked us on the radio by name and just poo-pooed the whole idea. This is several years ago. I heard about it. I didn't hear him, but people tell me about it. I said, uh, so the next time church met, I said, uh, people, I said, I understand Pastor so-and-so doesn't believe that a Christian can have a demon. and He's making fun of the whole idea. I said, he has a nice large congregation. Let's just pray that the Lord will have one explode right under his nose, up close, so he and his whole congregation can see them. They won't come over here. So let them see it right up close so they can believe. It took a couple of weeks, but bluey! And sure enough, somebody he knew beyond the shadow of doubt to be born again exploded. Guess what they finally had to do? Guess where they had to bring her to get help. <laughs> Talk about the mountain coming to Mohammed, I'll tell you. It was the only place that help could be. God has said, I'll make your enemies come to your feet if you'll be faithful to be what I want you to be. This is the end of part A. Please play part B. Thank you.
Our website is www.lakehamiltonbiblecamp.com and lhbconline.com. There are many free audio files there. It's like going to Bible school at home. Our website is www.lhbconline.com. There are many free audio files there. It's like going to Bible school at home. Memorial Weekend Deliverance Seminar, Friday evening, May the 23rd, 1980, Lake Hamilton Bible Camp, Hot Springs, Arkansas. Wynn Worley is the teacher of the evening. This is now the conclusion of this message from Part A. Matter of fact, the preacher got mad and he hit the pulpit one Sunday morning and he blasted the Hegwish Church and all these people that would go there and just invited them to get out of the church. I heard about it. I said, well, bless his heart. He just needs to see it up close. He's seeing it long distance and he is out of focus. Lord, let's just pray and let the Lord just put it right up close. Guess what? In a Sunday morning service, in a week or so, right in the middle of the sermon, a man stood up and went berserk, <laughs> screaming, hollering. He turned and the whole congregation was just frozen. Can you imagine that happening in a regular church? I mean, it destroyed the worship. I mean, paralysis set in. It wasn't creeping paralysis, it was pouncing paralysis. I mean, it grabbed everybody. And the, the poor man, he, the tormented man, he jumped up and he ran screaming out of the church, ran out into the cornfield screaming. That whole church just said that. The preacher was white as a sheet. As far as I know, he hadn't said a word about deliverance since then. May not have convinced him, but sure shut him up. <laughs> By the way, the preacher that hit us on the radio did have the grace. He got on the radio and said he was wrong. He was dead wrong. That's more grace than most of God. Well, I suppose you're familiar with the fact. Well, of course, the next thing that comes, you say, you talk to somebody and they're having these tremendous problems and you say, well, you know, probably you need deliverance. Deliverance, what's that? Well, you know, you cast out demons. You think I'm demon-possessed? They do me well. Now I'll tell you how to answer that, because you know if you if you just very carefully suggest that somebody just might have a demon because they're you know every once in a while they get on a tear and they go up the wall with their teeth you know and and bounce off the top and they scream and kick and holler and all this kind of wild stuff they might have a demon you know something a little abnormal. Well, you know their their immediate response is you think I'm demon possessed. I mean, you know, they look like they might kill you if you said yes. I mean, they're just insulted. Well, what you tell them is, <laughs> no, I don't think so. Well, then they come down to earth, you know. And then you hit them. But undoubtedly, you have demons. You see... The word possession occurs in our English translation, but it does not occur in the original language. Friend, the devil was at the translator's table, too. And that problem has caused, that's caused a lot of problems, you know. Possessed with demons. Possessed with demons. It never says that. The Greek has three words. It says to have a demon, to be demonized, to be demoned. That's the three and only three expressions. They are translated vexed, to have a demon. To be demonized, I don't think it, to be demonized in there, in uh, one or two cases it says possessed. And of course, immediately, when you mention demons, I don't think Christian can be possessed. I don't either. Well, I know he can't. I know there's one part of him that's sealed off. It can't possibly be. There's a seal there. But he can be covered up with them. And he can look like it and talk like it and act like it sometimes. It'd be hard for you to know unless you had discernment from the Lord. Know the difference. What I'm simply saying is people have gone off the deep end and believed what they want to be true. They don't want to know how bad it is. You know, you, when, you, when the Holy Spirit shows you the truth about deliverance, and He has to do this, you will not know this in the natural. Did you know that? The Holy Spirit must show you. That's why it does no good to argue with people. 
People start arguing with me, I'll say, all right. It's like the man that told me, he said, I don't have any demons. I said, all right. He said, but, he said, uh, you don't think, you, you don't believe that, do you? And I said, nope. He said, you mean you think I have a demon? I said, nope. Oh, he said. I said, you have several legions. <laughs> See, they travel in bunches. They don't go singly. It's very unlikely that you have a demon. One man who was supposed to have been very deep into Satanism. He even wrote a book about it. I heard him stand up and say, Oh, I believe in deliverance. After he'd made fun of Don Basham and Derek Prince. This is several years ago. Now, I sat in the service and heard him say this. He said, Why, I believe in deliverance. After I was saved, three or four of my Christian brothers got together and they threw seven demons out of me. I turned to my wife. I said, I've seen seven legions in a baby that hadn't done anything. You mean that fellow that's been in all that mess got clean with seven? Of course, I could see a bunch of them sticking out on him like horns anyhow, you know. He was still loaded, bless his heart. He since then left his wife and children, run off with some other younger gal. She said, we're living in a new day. Oh, it's not that new, people. It's not that new. All right. Now, believers are attacked. Look at Job, chapter 1 and 2. First and second chapters of Job tell you about the attacks on a believer. By the way, Job was the best man who was living on the earth. He wasn't just some little uh, bottom-of-the-level man. He was the top shelf. And the believer was attacked and attacked savagely. How did he win? He kept on believing God. By the way, he didn't have the book of Job to read and see how it turned out either. All he had was his bare faith in the Lord. God didn't come to him and say, Now, Job, my son, you're about to go through a lot of trials and tribulations, but you'll be all, you'll be all right, son, because you're going to come out all right in the end. And you just, uh, I'll give you a nice pep talk to get you all set so you won't be afraid and you won't be frightened when all this comes upon you. God didn't say anything. This thing hit just like a tornado, bloom, and wiped him out in every area of his life. He had to hang on to his faith in God, much to Satan's dismay. In Mark uh, 1.23, Jesus stood up and read the Scriptures, and a man with unclean spirit jumped up and screamed, I doubt seriously if that man knew he had that unclean spirit. I've seen this happen in services in different places in the country. A lot of times I'd be preaching or just reading the Bible or maybe singing. You know, I don't sing that bad. <laughs> but I've had, I've had them just pop up and start screaming, Shut up! I don't want to hear it. Well, you know, can't be popular with everybody. <laughs> this man with an unclean spirit leaped up, and I doubt seriously if the man knew it when this spirit manifested, but the spirit couldn't stand it anymore. He leaped up and said, We know who you are. He said, You hush. Well, that's another sore point, you know. Worldly talks to demons. That's wrong. Is that so? Jesus said he forbade them to speak. Would you please read and see why he forbade them to speak? Why did he forbid them to speak? Friend, about a week before the crucifixion, the Pharisees knew beyond the shadow of a doubt that Jesus Christ was claiming to be the Messiah, the very Son of God. Once they knew for sure that's what he was claiming, it didn't take them very long to get him on the cross. Jesus, from the very word go, when he made public appearances, these demons would pop up and say, You're the Son of God. We know you. And he'd say, Hush, you be quiet. He didn't do that to the gathering because there wasn't anybody there except his disciples. But when he was in the synagogue, when he was out with a crowd around him, with his enemies there, he forbade them to speak. And the Scripture is explicit. It says, because they knew who he was. They were spilling the beans. They identified him as the Son of God. And you see, 
had he allowed that to go on, the Pharisees would have become convinced. They would have moved in before his ministry was finished. And it had God had purposed for his ministry to run a certain time. And then his son would give his life. That was the purpose of God and the will of God. The demons were crossing that, and that's why Jesus stopped them from talking. One reason that people have dropped out of deliverance, one reason they are not knowledgeable in many areas about the demons, how they operate, one reason they're not able to get the demons out is because they never under any circumstances will allow the demons to talk. They bind them, they choke them off, and they refuse to let them speak. So what the demons do, they drop out of sight and they say, Now, brother, you're free. You're certainly not. The demon is quieted down you think he's gone. He's not. I have to tell you this. You won't carry this out of here, will you? Glenn, please cut this off the recording. I'd hate for this to get out on me. I was over someplace, I don't remember, somewhere across the country, west, out west somewhere. And a demon was screaming at me, and he was, they just scream at me all the time. And I tell them, I said, I'm really a nice old man. You'd probably like me if you got to know me. <laughs> then they just have a spasm. But anyway, um, this demon was a, he, he was a world ruler. I keep running into these big boys every once in a while. And uh, he was a world ruler. He said, Willie, why aren't you a faith preacher? I drew myself up. I said, I am a faith preacher. He said, no, you're not. He said, you just, said the faith preacher said, they just lay hands on somebody and pray about five minutes. They said, out in the name of Jesus. Now walk it out, brother, sister. You're all right. You're free. He said, we don't even have to manifest for them. He said, but not you. Oh, he said, how he hates you and that stupid bunch of people that believe like you do. He said, you just keep on and on and on. And oh, and we drive a person out of a nut mind. And we have to manifest and we don't want to. I said, you also have to come out, don't you? He said, shut your mouth. <laughs> well, in that case, I'm glad I'm not a faith preacher. If that's their definition. But people, a lot of that garbage is going on. Batting butterflies and chasing blackbirds. Any little kid can say it. Shoo! And the little butterfly demons, they're gone. You can take a rock and throw it in a tree full of black birds, and that whole bunch will go, shoo, and they're gone. Well, that's great. I mean, I'm in favor of demons leaving of whatever variety they are. But you grab a rhinoceros by the tail, dear friend, and you just give it a yank and say, come out there, big boy. He'll turn around and look at you and say, what did you say, you idiot? I said, come out of there in Jesus' name. No. That's when I want one of those faith boys to step up and take over. Show me what they're talking about. I want to see their product. I don't want to hear them talk about it. I want to see it done. And you say, I have authority over you. He says, so what? You are a defeated enemy. So what? I'm not coming out. I've been here for years and I'm not coming out. I don't want to. That can be kind of... Humbling, that means you have to settle down and go to work. <laughs> Friend, work is some, some people are allergic to work. This will come as a surprise to you. Some preachers and a lot of Christian workers are just downright lazy. They don't want to work. They want, they're the glory boys, you know. They want it to happen quick. Whoop, 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 whoop. Toot, 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 here comes the trumpet, you know. Well, I think it's nice to toot the trumpet after you have something tooted about. Of course, sometimes you're so tired, you don't feel like tooting too much. Amen. Usually after our services, we leave the service singing, God's got an army, and it's dragging through the land. You know. <laughs> when we start the service, we're marching, you know, oh boy. But after we leave, boy, we're dragging usually. But that's all right, we'll be back, we'll be in better shape next service, we'll be ready to go again. Praise the Lord. We've got to have some people who pour themselves out for this people. We've got to defeat the enemy. In order to do that, you've got to be more persistent than he is. In order to do that, you've got to be more determined than he is. In order to be that, you've got to match him with dedication. 
I'll tell you, the people in the devil's service put us to shame. Two different people last year brought us word, direct from Africa. One was a missionary and one was somebody who had been to Africa. At two separate occasions, they stood and told our congregation that the witches in Africa are going on 30 and 40 day fast with the explicit purpose of breaking up Christian marriages, especially among Christian leaders, to destroy the force of Christianity in Africa and especially in America. By the way, the dreadful news came over the radio this morning. Anita Brown is divorcing her husband. Irreconcilable differences. She claims that she is being exploited by her husband and others at the expense, and they will not let her get into her ministry. She needs to get under her husband's cover and quit worrying about whether she's got a ministry or not. Bless her heart. Good woman, pray. Let's pray that thing will break. You realize how much the devil's going to get out of that? How much good he's going to get out of that? Oh, I thought she was the one that wanted the home to be steady. Ah, ha, 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 ha. You see, many in the gay community who are into witchcraft have been hurling curses at that woman and her husband. And bless their hearts, they are like many fundamental Bible-believing Christians. They have no knowledge nor strength against such attack. Those of us who know more should pray definitely and specifically for that. Amen? All right. Man in the synagogue. There's no reason to think he wasn't a, wasn't a believer. He was in a worship place. The demon exploded. I've seen them explode in believers many times. Now, over in uh, Luke chapter 13, verses 11 through 16, Jesus comes in contact with a lady who is all bent over and twisted out of shape by deformity. And Jesus said, this was a daughter of Abraham who had been bent with this spirit of infirmity, could not straighten up for 18 years. He calls her a daughter of Abraham. Do you know who Abraham, what Abraham's nickname is in the Bible? Father of the faithful. Jesus specifically said she is a daughter of Abraham. This dear believing woman had been bound by an evil spirit for 18 long years. But thank God Jesus broke his power and let that woman go free. Oh, people, listen. We know so little. Whatever you do, when you get into deliverance, when you start reading and studying, and when you get to working in deliverance and helping people get free. Whatever you do, don't be stupid enough to get puffed up with pride and think you know it all. We are learning every week new things. The fourth book, Annihilating the Host of Hell, the Battle Royal, is over halfway done. I asked that principality I was talking to on the phone in New York. I said, how do you like the fourth book? He said, I hate it. It's worse than the others. <laughs> that was encouraging. It's really good to have it reviewed by the enemy, you know. We are learning every week that goes by new things of how to defeat the enemy, new insights into how he works and how he gains a foothold, and thereby how we can destroy them and loose the people of God so they can take their spiritual authority and, and inherit their inheritance, possess their possession. We have not yet seen anything of the power that God will unleash through His people when they just begin to get free. Are you aware that every major revival effort, every great move of God has always had casting out of demons in it? And are you aware that you'll have to dig and dig and dig to find that out because it's been kind of played down and you, you'll have to read some of the things that are written right at the time it happened because most of the time... It's played down to the place you don't even hear about it. But demons manifested, people barking like dogs, shaking all over, rolling in the floors, all kinds of things. The best documented is the Welsh Revival, War on the Saints. But most of the other moves of God, when you get to digging into them, they started with the casting out of demons. The great Pentecostal movement that started the turn of the century. 
What was the main push of it? Boom! The latter rain. Boom! Demons. They were throwing out demons all across the country. And for this they were destroyed. The organized church has fought casting out demons ever since when? I've been doing some digging for the new book. It'll be in the new book. Quotations from the early church fathers from the, uh, from the 200s and 300s right up close to the church itself. Guess what? All of them were casting out demons in Jesus' name. One of them, one nut, I can't remember exactly the quote, but I'll give you the paraphrase of what he said. He stood before a Roman governor. He said, if I cannot cast this evil spirit out of this demoniac, if I cannot set him free in the name of Jesus of Nazareth, then I am a false prophet. Wow. You want to do that? Guess we better get to practicing a little better, huh? Looks like we've got a ways to go where we can speak with such confidence. He knew his authority, and he set that man free. People, it's going to get that way again. You're going to have to not just talk and say, I'm a Christian. You're going to have to prove it. And you're going to find out that most of the churches, perhaps 90% or more, are running on pure soul power. That's, that's earthly human enthusiasm. That's good works. Good works. Rich and creamy. Good works. Sweet and lovely. If the Holy Spirit were to go on vacation and He were to announce for two weeks I'm not going to do anything on the earth, do you realize that the majority of fundamental Bible-believing, Bible-preaching churches of whatever name they have, do you realize that their services would be totally uninterrupted? Do you realize that their worship would continue? Do you realize that their preaching would continue? They'd continue to say, didn't our pastor preach a good sermon? So full of the Spirit. You bet. Even though the Holy Spirit was absent, there was plenty of spirit. The same kind of spirit that's at an Amway meeting. <laughs> that just slipped right out. Anybody believe that? The same kind of spirit that's at a Masonic Lodge meeting. The same kind of spirit that's in a super sales meeting to get the salesman charged up. Sell, 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 sell. You can do that. You can get a crowd together. You can build multi-million dollar buildings, which will go under when the crash comes. They're mortgaged to the hill. They'll never make it through, people. You can do all these things, and you don't need the Holy Spirit at all. You can start in the Spirit and end up in the flesh. You know what I hear? Here's another lie. I better. Oh, I saw a rabbit just run right across the trail. I just caught a glimpse of it. Here's a fallacious thing that's running around the country. I bump into it every once in a while. Well, if you don't, if things are not going right in the service, start off in the flesh and you'll end up in the Spirit. You sure will. But it won't be the kind of Spirit you think it is. It'll be a lovely religious spirit. Friend, let's start in the spirit and stay in the spirit of the Holy Spirit. If you are dependent on the Holy Spirit for power, you really can't move without Him. Now, none of us are immune and none of us are, are omnipotent. There are none of us who know everything that needs to be known. All of us are, are fallible, full of false flaws. If it were not for the Lord, we'd all be wiped out. The demons have said repeatedly, Worley, if you and that stupid bunch of yours had any idea how much power you have, how much authority you have, and if you knew how to use it, we wouldn't stand a chance. Isn't that encouraging? I'm so glad I let the demons talk. They just encourage me every once in a while, you know. I mean, they can tell you some encouraging things. They don't mean to. 
But the Holy Spirit will verify that the enemy is in consternation. Listen, people. Don't believe all the fallacious earth. Oh, there's so many more here. Daughter of Abraham, that was a woman who was a believer, bound by an evil spirit. Uh, then uh, there was a member in Corinth over there, 1 Corinthians 5. We already read about that. Uh, in Luke 4, 38, you'll find a spirit of fever was cast out of Peter's wife's mother, the first pope's mother-in-law. <laughs> does sound kind of ridiculous, doesn't it? Peter's wife's mother. There's no reason to believe that woman was not a was not a believer, and yet a spirit of fever was cast out of her, out of a believer. And then uh, in Acts. 10, 38, talks about sickness and oppression of the devil. In, uh, in Matthew uh, 16, 13 through 23, you find Peter making that magnificent confession. Whom, uh, Jesus said, whom do, you say, uh, whom do men say that I am? And he said, well, they said, well, some say you're Elijah, some say this, some say that. And Jesus said, but who do you say that I am? Peter spoke up as a spokesman of, of the whole group by a revelation from God and said, Thou art the Christ, the Son of the living God. Jesus immediately said, Flesh and blood has not revealed this to you, Simon Barjona, but my Father, which is in heaven, revealed that to you. It wasn't five minutes. Jesus began to talk about His leaving them is going uh, and being disgraced and going out in disgrace and dying. And Peter began to rebuke him. And Jesus turned to this man out of whom had come this magnificent revelation, Thou art the Christ, the Son of the living God. He turned to this same man five minutes later and said, Get thee behind me, Satan. You savor not the things of God, but of the devil. A spirit had gained a foothold in Peter to try to discourage the Lord. Of course, you have to realize, you know, the devil is at a terrible disadvantage attacking Jesus. The devil sent everything he had against Jesus Christ. It was like a rowboat armed with a pea shooter attacking a battleship. <laughs> really, you have to kind of feel sorry for the devil. He really, I mean, you know, Jesus Christ took everything he had and just steamed right on to the goal, which was to give himself so that we could be saved. Well, over in, uh, in Acts 8, 20 through 24, Simon the magician had already believed and was baptized, but he had been into the occult. And those occult spirits reared up in him and caused him trouble. Let's take a quick look at that. It's kind of an interesting account. In Acts 8, Acts 8, 20, I believe is where it starts. Verse 18. When Simon saw that through the laying on of the apostles' hands the Holy Ghost was given, he offered them money, said, Give me also this power that on whomsoever I lay hands he may receive the Holy Spirit. And Peter goes on and says, Repent, verse 22, this day of thy wickedness, and pray, God, if the fault of thine heart be forgiven thee, for you are in the gall of bitterness and a bond of iniquity. Now look at this man. The, this is a man who had heard and believed. But he was messed up. By the way, Peter dealt rather directly with the problem, didn't he? He didn't mince words. He said, Brother, you are on thin ice. Now, if that had been today, they would have had to call a council. Now, brother, we feel that perhaps you, there may be merit in what you say. However, and they would have circled around and around and around. They never got to it. Peter just turned and, and said, Your money perish with you. Some people say, he's not loving. Friend, there was cancer. And he took the only remedy. The shock treatment was the only thing Simon could understand. I use a shock treatment sometimes. Every once in a while, you know, in deliverance, 
you, you meet everybody and everybody's dogs, you know, they come for help. Bless their hearts, they do. They come streaming in. And every once in a while I get somebody, and they have a spirit we call motor mouth. They can talk the horns off a of billy goat. Sometimes I feel like saying, bad. No. I mean, they, they get started and they just won't stop. They say they won't help, but really all they want to do is talk. I, I got to where now, I'll just look at them and I say, hey, look, we you stop and pray? Well, no, I think you need to know about this, about Grandma's sore toe back under. I said, no, we already know enough to pray. Well, let me tell you this, and then I'll tell you this. And, and boy, I mean, it goes on and on and on. One day I looked at a poor lady that was doing this, and I said, hey, sis, if you don't shut up, I'm not going to pray. I said, either you shut up right now and we pray, or I'm not going to pray at all. She looked at me kind of stunned, you know. Well, there was no use wasting time. There were 20 other people waiting for prayer. They didn't want to talk. They wanted, they wanted action. Me too. Bind that motor mouth spirit. That's what, I don't know what its real name is. That's what we call it. Motor mouth. My wife loves to get motor mouth. She's sweet and long-suffering. She has to be because she lives with me. <laughs> Say amen, hon. <laughs> She'll tell me later on. Uh, but uh, seriously, you know, there's, there's too much to be done for people who just want to waste time. I used to have a lady... She, you know, I, I go to bed late. I used to say I'm a hoot owl, but I don't like owls anymore, so I don't say that anymore. <laughs> I'm a night people. And uh, uh, I, I, go, I go to bed late, and I don't like morning no matter when it comes. <laughs> and uh, I mean, morning's that, that dreadful time of the day, you know. And uh, about midnight to 3 o'clock in the morning, I'm really on high ground, you know. And Glenn, he's not like that. He goes to bed early and gets up. He gets up waking the birds up in the morning. Ugh. How nauseous. Yeah. Now, he's a party pooper. Now, but seriously, <laughs> there was a lady. She got in the habit of calling me about 7 o'clock every morning. I pick up the phone. Hello. After all, I'd been in bed almost four hours. Pastor Worley, I knew you'd want to know so-and-so, and I thought, Lord, restrain me <laughs> from telling her how I don't want to know about that. And she went on winding this little ball of yarn, you know, round and round and round. And I just lay there and listened, you know, mm-hmm, uh-huh, yeah, okay, mm-hmm. Well, yank, 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 yank. One morning I was real nasty. I called her name and I said, look, I've been in bed three hours. I'm sleepy. I don't want to talk to you. Bang. She quit calling for a while. Because I've had other calls too. I had some real pleasant ones. I remember one time, phone rang at 3 o'clock in the morning. I said, hello? This is Beelzebub. <laughs> I said, I rebuke you in the name of Jesus. <laughs> he said, oh, now why did you have to do that? I said, I rebuke you in the name of Jesus. He said, now you did it again. <laughs> didn't take long to get rid of him. He didn't call anymore. <laughs> By the way, uh, you can do that if you get obscene phone calls. That's a fun time. I rebuke you in the name of Jesus. I send the angels of God after you. <laughs> well, quit calling. Well, really, I, I go over across the country telling people, you know, deliverance is really a fun ministry. I mean, if you want an exciting life, something that's different, endless variety, all kinds of interesting people and persons, you get into deliverance. You'll never be bored again. You may never be rested again, but you... 
In Acts 5.3, the story of Ananias and Sapphira. They were in the church. They even came and sold property and brought. Had a little scheme to withhold a little bit for a rainy day. And it came up cloudburst. And the day they brought it forward, there was a gully washer. Peter looked at them and said, Why has Satan filled your heart to lie to the Holy Ghost? Don't say Ananias and Sapphira were lost. They were believers who had been seized by a carnal spirit of covetousness, which led them to lie to the Holy Spirit. Peter pointed that out. He said, you sold the property. It was yours. If you just wanted to give part of it, why did you come and say we're giving this much? But you came and said, we have given all. Therefore, you lied. And that was where the dreadful sin lay. Well, in uh, 2 Corinthians 12, 7, you're going to have real trouble with that one. Paul was buffeted by a messenger of Satan in the flesh. Maybe he wasn't saved. Don't try that approach. That doesn't work too well, does it? You wouldn't find many heroes there. I mean, they'd say, "Uh uh-uh, can't go that route. Well, then if he wasn't, he himself, by his own testimony, said he was buffeted by a messenger of Satan in his flesh. Oh, I know, you know, they come upon you. They're pressing from the outside. He said, it's in my flesh. Now, Dr. Haggard's so radical, he found a place over there where Paul got rid of it. Maybe he'll tell you about it. I was going to do that. I couldn't remember it, Marcus, where it was. All right, just go ahead and show out, Marcus. Galatians 3.14. I forgot how ugly you are, Marcus. In 2 Corinthians 11.4, it gets even thicker. Look at that a moment. 2 Corinthians 11.4. Some of these scriptures have been totally overlooked by the enemies of deliverance. It's as if they never saw them at all. Verse 3 of chapter 11, 2 Corinthians. 2 Corinthians 11.3. But I fear, lest by any means, as the serpent beguiled or bewitched or cast a spell on Eve through his subtlety, So your mind should be corrupted from the simplicity that is in Christ. For if he that cometh preaches another Jesus, whom we have not preached, or if you... Who is this written to, by the way? To the believers in Corinth, right? So we would be not stretching at all if you believers in Corinth receive another spirit. Is it possible for believers to receive another spirit. Why would Paul warn them about it? An impossibility. If you receive another spirit which you have not received. Now, they had received the Holy Spirit. They had received also the spirits of God. When Marcus begins to preach on the the spirits of God, he will show you how that in the letters that Paul wrote, he was constantly loosing the spirits of God on the people he, he wrote to. A glorious truth that's been overlooked. But God never did overlook it. He's uncovering it for our blessing and our benefit. If you receive another spirit that you've not received, Paul would have never written that were it not possible to receive another spirit. Now, look at Galatians chapter 3. Galatians chapter 3. And look down to verse 1. O foolish Galatians, Who has bewitched you or cast a spell on you that you should not obey the truth before whose eyes Jesus Christ has been evidently set forth crucified among you? The Galatians had had a spell cast on them. Bewitched is a term of magic, witchcraft. And he said, Who has done this to you that you should believe and not obey the truth after you've already known it? This, by the way, this Galatian letter will help you to understand why a lot of believers who know better are not doing better. And why they've been exposed to the truth and will turn their back on it and do the opposite. Why they'll see a miracle 
And you see them a week later and they say, oh, I don't believe that. Uh, they see a demon cast out and seemingly they're all convinced. They say, yeah, that's right. It's really true. I didn't see, I didn't see it before, but now I understand it. You see them two days later. They've been over to their pastor. He said, why, a Christian can't have a demon? Really? Well, of course not. You know your spirit filled. You know this. You know that. And, and you see them again? Nope. No way. But you saw it. Well, no, but it's not true. It's, it's not right. I can't explain it, but it's still not right. It's unbelievable. I'll tell you something else. People who are in a church under the authority of a pastor who teaches you cannot have a demon seldom can be helped in deliverance. Well, let that soak in. Well, this has been discovered on the warfare field. Dr. Haggard called me about it once. He said, when? He said, we just found out something. I don't know whether you bumped into this or not, but said, when you are in deliverance, if you have... So I said, we had a boy in deliverance, and he was coming along just fine. He'd had several sessions, getting better all the time. And all of a sudden, the deliverance, he kept coming, but the deliverance suddenly shut off. We couldn't figure out what happened. Suddenly, it wouldn't work anymore. He didn't make any more headway. As a matter of fact, he started backtracking a little, losing ground. He had started going to a fellowship, had put himself under the authority of a pastor who taught fervently no Christian could have a demon. And his own deliverance was stopped, dead in its tracks. You better stay away from the literature and the tapes of people who believe that a Christian can't have a demon. You will pick that thing up in your spirit if you're not careful. And it can block your own deliverance. I'm not telling you what to do. I'm telling you where some warning signs are. Be careful. This thing is very, very strong and the devil is against it. Now look at 1 Timothy 4.1, please. 1 Timothy 4.1. Very interesting passage where Paul writes, Now the Spirit speaketh expressly that in the latter times some shall depart from the faith, giving heed to seducing spirits and doctrines of demons. You think people haven't been seduced by spirits away from the truth? Friend, everywhere I go I find people who used to do deliverance. They now found a better way, a higher ministry. The demons have repeatedly offered to put me into a higher ministry. A higher ministry pays better financially. It gets a lot of crowds and most of the people like you instead of throwing up their hands in horror when you come to town. They'll pack the auditoriums to see you rather than to throw up their hands and scream and say, Oh, he's come again, that terrible man. The higher ministries are lovely. Demons have told me we would offer you this higher ministry. But he said, you're too blankety-blank smart. You'd figure out what we were doing, so we're just going to tell you flat out we want to buy you. Said, we fooled some of the others. Said, they were stupid. They actually thought their God told them to move out of deliverance and into these other ministries. <coughs> you're welcome. Be careful, people. Don't let anything get you off the trail. Deliverance is the thing the devil hates with a fervency and a passion that's hard for us to understand. Seducing spirits, doctrines of demons. You can fall into it. You're not immune. Now we're running late. Glenn set the clock fast. I want to give you just a rundown of a brief outline. You can jot these scriptures and check them. I won't have time to develop them at all. I want to give you, show you something that demons in Christians is presented in type in the Scriptures. You know what a type is? That's a scriptural picture that gives you an overview of the truth. Where is, where is the temple of God today? What? No, you're not. That your body is the temple of the Holy Spirit. Let me give you some interesting scriptures here. That's in 1 Corinthians 6.19, by the way. This human body temple can be invaded, can be raped by seducing spirits, corrupted, can be destroyed, right? The temple. Man defiles the temple. That's talked about in 1 Corinthians 6.13-19. Now, I want you to see a picture. In 
2 Thessalonians 2, 3, and 4, Paul discusses the Antichrist. And he talks about the Antichrist who sits as God in the temple of God and defiles the temple. Are you following me? That Antichrist who is sitting in the temple of God is a picture of what happens in the believer who is the temple of God. That vicious spirit sits in there as God wants to take charge, to rule, to wreck and to ruin. Exactly what the Antichrist plans to do on the earth. But in miniature, you're seeing it in the believers already working. Spirit of Antichrist. You might want to jot down some references to the son of perdition, which is one of the titles of the Antichrist. In John 17:12. John 6:70 and in John 13:27 I just want to drop that on you to let you know that this thing about the antichrist being in the temple of God if you don't think a demon is antichrist I've got you better think again demons sitting in the temple of God as God you don't have to be in deliverance very long until a demon looks at you and says I'm in charge here Leave us alone. He belongs to us. She belongs to us. You leave us alone. What we need in these days is to quit quibbling and splitting hairs and get down to the business of doing what Jesus said. He said, These signs shall, a legal term, shall, meaning without a doubt. These signs shall, without a doubt, Follow those who do what? Believe. What is the first and primary reason people do not cast out demons? They do not believe. They may believe Jesus is the Christ. They may believe He's born of a virgin. They may believe He rose from the grave. They may believe a lot of good, sound Bible doctrine. But they do not believe what He said about casting out demons. Therefore, they don't do it. Those who believe in my name shall they cast out devils. If you're here tonight and you've never asked Jesus in your heart, that's the main thing you need to settle. If you haven't asked Jesus in your heart or if you're not sure you have, by all means, ask Him into your heart tonight. Jesus said, Behold, I stand at the door and knock. If any man hear my voice and open the door, I'll come in. If you've never asked Him in or you're not sure about it, by all means, ask Him to come in. Pray something like this. Lord Jesus, if I've never really asked you in my heart before, I'm asking you here and now, come into my heart and save me from all my sins. If he's not in your heart, he'll come in. If he's there already, he'll tell you why you're confused. You can't lose that way. You say, supposing I do that, nothing happens. And you come to the front, see me or Brother Glenn, one of the other workers up here, and say, I need to talk to somebody about salvation. Get it fixed on the Word of God. That'll never change. Once it's fixed, then you're on your way. You say, that's not my problem. I'm being driven. I'm being harassed. I'm being tormented. It's producing compulsive behavior then you're talking about the work of demons. These signs shall follow those who believe. In my name shall they cast out demons. And that isn't a question. That's an absolute statement. If that's your problem, by all means seek help in the mighty name of Jesus Christ. We're going to pray for some people. We're going to put a cutoff limit on it because we're planning to run a pretty intense thing here. But we will pray for some people tonight if we can to get you free. There are workers here who believe the people who believe are the ones who can cast out evil spirits. Could we stand and sing, I believe in the Lord, one more time? You've been so tired and sitting there so long. Let's stretch up and get relaxed again, okay? And make your way forward. Instruments, you can go ahead and play if you like, and we'll just let you come forward now if you need help. This is the end of this message. Our website is www.lakehamiltonbiblecamp.com and lhbconline.com. There are many free audio files there. It's like going to Bible school at home. Thank you.